Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the 2021 Biomed Device Boston event. We're glad to have you here. I'd like to introduce our next panel. Uh, they're going to be talking about my CMDO has been acquired. Now what? Um, we've got some, some experts here who are going to walk you through some of the most important issues around this. Uh, and I'm going to start you off with an introduction to Dave Dykeman, who is uh, going to be the panel moderator. He's with Greenberg Traurig and has a lot of experience in the industry. So if you would please help me welcome Dave and our panelists. All right. Thank you, Lori. It's great to be here. It's great to be at an in-person conference and see some faces or we see some familiar mass, um, some, some familiar eyeballs. But we've got a great panel today, a lot of med tech industry experience to talk about what's going on in contract development and manufacturing organizations. 2020 was a record year for M&A and consolidation in the CDMO industry, and 2021 is on pace to break all those records. There's a large consolidation. There's a lot of smaller operations that are banding together or getting gobbled up, depending on which perspective you're looking at. And a lot of it is driven by private equity dollars, where they're buying the smaller players, putting them together and rolling them up, and creating more efficient and larger organizations that can serve some of the larger med tech functions around. So we have a great panel, and we'll introduce them shortly. But first, we wanted to see who's in the audience. So how many of you work at a CDMO, a contract design or manufacturing organization? OK. How many of you work at an OEM? Got one in the front row, Peter Stebbins. And how many of you are consulting or involved in this industry in that way? And how many work at, have worked at a large med tech company during their tenure somewhere along the way? So most of the crowd. So that'll set us up for success. And we're gonna you know, introduce the panelists now and I'm gonna have them tell us about their expertise and also talk about a trend they're seeing in the contract development and manufacturing organization consolidation. So right to my left, we'll start with Carlos Dimimilio. Um, he's a partner at Alera Health, flew in from San Francisco to talk to us today, so he'll have a great West Coast perspective. So Carlo, introduce yourself a little more and tell us what you're seeing in the industry. Thank you, Dave. Um, nice to have you and <laughs> pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a partner at Alira Health, which is a, a service provider to the life sciences with a mission to accelerate uh, the development of the medical products and businesses. And uh, we do that through a variety of, of services that uh, mimic the life cycle of, of medical technology from uh, early product development through regulatory and clinical affairs, business strategy, which is really the core business historically, and um, and then a broker dealer transaction advisory practice, which I represent, where we help uh, entrepreneurs, venture backed uh, med device companies to generate exits and facilitate partnerships with uh, large strategics. Uh, within this um, position of privilege as a deal maker, I've been involved for the past decade with uh, the contract manufacturing industry, and uh, it's been um, terrific journey and uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of experiencing firsthand what Dave was describing and this um, growing trend of industry consolidation and uh, um, I've, I've learned something along the way um, and uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, sharing my thoughts during the panel. Uh, as regarding the trend, uh, obviously there is such an appetite and hunger for inorganic growth in the CDMO space that it's, it's difficult to pinpoint something really specific. Um, within the large activity across the supply chain, uh, different type of capabilities around plastics, contract manufacturing. I wanna, um, I wanna talk about uh, the, something that has been accelerating in the past 12 to 18 months, which is the um, the focus of established CDMOs to develop or acquire uh, front-end design and development capabilities. Uh, engineering to assist customers with the early development of medical devices to, first of all, to optimize 
the cost and the features of the device, but also from a business point of view to establish long-term partnerships with their OEM clients. And that is something that is uh, picking up uh, pace as a driver for M&A as well. So I thought that was something worth uh, mentioning. And with that, I'll uh, pass along uh, to my, my colleague here. Yeah, thank you, Carlo. And we'll hear more. Carlo has really done a deep dive with Alira Health of what's going on in the CDMO industry. So we'll get a he'll set the table and uh, tell us more about that later. And our next panelist is Vincent Wong, who's the chief quality officer at Tom's Corporation um, located in Connecticut. So Vincent, tell us a little more about what you're doing at Tom's and a trend you're seeing. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like you said, Vincent Wong, Chief Quality Officer at Tom's Corporation. We are a contract manufacturer primarily focused in the spine and orthopedic space. Uh, so we partner with OEMs, large and small, on uh, primarily design transfers, design for manufacturing through commercialization. And prior to Tom's, I've been there about a year now. Um, most My entire career has been in med device. Um, most of it in contract manufacturing. I uh, started off at uh, Covidian, now Medtronic, in their surgical division doing post-market surveillance. I uh, did a short stint doing development of class one and class two diagnostic uh, um, med, med devices. And then the largest stint uh, at, at Surtec Medical doing concept through commercialization of active implantables, uh, focused primarily on neuromodulation. So most of it being in contract manufacturing, on the execution and on the operational side, uh, my expertise or my background is primarily in essentially that going through DH, G, DHF management with OEMs, walking through napkin sketch all the way through design transfer and sustained manufacturing support, but then also through these contract manufacturers and acquisitions, uh, supporting QMS harmonization and deployment. So multi-site organizations trying to operate and navigate the ISO and FDA requirements while still making it lean and adaptable for OEMs to partner with, um, that's primarily where a lot of my focus has been in my career is between servicing customers to best adapt to their needs uh, from an ISO standpoint, but also from their customer requirements, but then uh, establishing a strong quality management system through software and processes uh, to, to help them execute there. Um, with that, my, my trend or the, the, what I've been seeing in the last couple of years is obviously with all the acquisition activity that's been occurring, very quick to acquire, whether it's on the OEM or the, on the contract manufacturing side. But where I see challenges are the follow through run execution. So call it acquisition of five or 10 or 15 organizations uh, still operating as X number of uh, different companies. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like, what the challenges are, and ensuring that there is that follow through uh, on the acquisition side. Now, thank you, Vincent, and looking forward to hearing from that. And our third and final panelist is Chuck Searin, who is um, the VP of Medical Devices and Life Sciences at Propel. Propel is a commercial stage um, company that has a very unique solution to help the medical device and life science industry. They have the only unified QMS, quality management system, and PLM, product lifecycle management system together. And they're built on the Salesforce platform, which most companies already have. And Propel had exciting news. They just announced this morning, they closed their $20 million uh, Series C round and brought their total money raised now to close to 50 million. So Chuck, tell us about the excitement at Propel. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Chuck Saran, VP Industry Marketing. MedTech Life Sciences, a couple years of Propel, very excited. Uh, Dave did a great introduction of who Propel is, so that's, that's awesome, a product success platform here. Streamlines your data across the entire product life cycle, right, from concept to commercialization. So it includes information like your supplier data, your quality data, while also seamlessly connecting to customer and sales information as well. So I've been at Propel a couple of years. It's been very exciting. Um, prior to that, I was at Stryker for 10 years, deploying multiple uh, EQMS and PLM systems there. Um, and prior to that, another 10 years prior to that, I was a consultant in the EQMS, EQMS and PLM industry as well. And I think one of the questions was, uh, what, we're gonna talk a lot about some of the trends and some of the things that we're seeing, but I guess one trend that pops up lately is sort of a, a portal um, having an on-platform portal capability so that you can extend your platform across to your partners, to your suppliers, to your notified bodies that have access to tech files or maybe to meet regulations like IFU 
So this part note um, portal is just something that really has been trending a lot lately in my world if you ask for one. Thanks. So that's our panel and we thought we'd kind of get a good baseline for everybody. And as I mentioned, Carlo and Alira Health did a report that kind of examined this consolidation in the CDMO industry. So why don't we turn it over to Carlo? Why don't you tell us, you know, what's really going on in the CDMO consolidation over the last couple of years and what's driving it? Yeah, consolidation is happening, has been happening for um, a good part of the last decade and uh, will continue to happen in the foreseeable future. And uh, that all starts with um, uh, the OEM side, a uh, strong preference of uh, medical device companies to simplify their cost structure and uh, run um, more efficient, more profitable business. And um, uh, when it comes to outsourcing operations or part of the supply chain, that uh, translates into uh, moving to a, a variable cost uh, structure, uh, reducing cost of capital overall. And uh, that's a strategy that with the consolidation trend that is happening at the OEM le level with the big mergers and acquisition among uh, large medical device companies, uh, uh, Medtronic Covidian was uh, sort of started this process uh, several years ago. Uh, it, it became paramount for these medtech giants to become leaner and more efficient. Uh, and that has benefit, I created a huge demand for outsourcing services that has uh, trickled down to, to feed the growth of uh, multiple CDMOs um, a, of, of different size, scale, and capabilities. Um, that has prompted in, in this space uh, a motivation to become, um, to, to grow faster, to become more consolidated and vertically integrated to be able to win more business in this quest for this volume of outsourcing that were coming from the clientele and, and the big guys. Um, the accelerator of this process, as they pointed, has been um, the um, uh, entry in the space of uh, private equity investors who have seen an opportunity to act as a um, as an aggregator of uh, organization of small and, and mid-size and create larger platform with a more established uh, footprint, uh, greater uh, quality and, and high volume, high capacity, high throughput um, capabilities. And um, that has created um, a rush uh, of in corporate and, um, and financial investors to get first to, to acquire targets. And that's a, a process that is still very much in flux. Uh, the M&A market is super active. As you pointed, Dave, it's probably 2021 is gonna be a record year uh, with many assets on the market and a uh, huge appetite uh, that has pushed up um, uh, valuation and expectation of entrepreneurs also for, for large exits, which is sort of creating a a self-fulfilling uh, circle where uh, you know it's a seller's market and um, uh, it's perpetuating this trend of uh, uh, of you know of, of continuous uh, M&A consolidation, which is prompted to going back to to the beginning of my of my comment to a very strategic objectives by OEMs, which is focusing less on making the product, sometimes even on developing new technology inside and farming it out, and, uh, and just focusing on their core mission, which is distributing um, technology to, to patients and, um, and prompting innovation and addressing clinical needs. And Chuck, why don't you give us a little different uh, take on it? Okay. Yeah, I can add a little perspective, maybe add on to that. Um, you know, definitely from my perspective, we're seeing a, a much greater number, much greater rate of CDMOs um, that we're working with and, and seeing the increased rate of them. Um, also, their size much smaller, um, as well as much more highly specialized. So we're seeing a lot of people from the industry, executives, engineers, quality folks, you know, driving into the CDMO industry. Um, and it, I kind of look back like 20 years, I, and one of my past software companies worked a lot with the big giant, you know, contract manufacturers and EMSs, um, and those were our primary customers then, but they were just, you know, mostly dominant big, big players, and they focused a lot on sourcing components and, you know, pricing and costing, 
and um, very little visibility from the OEM perspective on what was being priced or exactly not collaborating at a high partnership level. And I think there's just been this big evolution that, that Carlo is really speaking to about how this partnership is forming, how you know business manufacturing process optimization and quality control and more testing, all of this stuff is starting, the CDMOs are starting to add to their, to their business line. The OEMs are recognizing, helping out design for manufacturability and doing design much earlier in that NPD process and contributing to that. Um, even regulatory, right? We, we're seeing them offer regulatory pathways and helping with those, those kind of design for regulatory stances as well. So I think those are the things I'm seeing from our, our customers and software perspective. Um, we're also seeing quite a few of our customers and prospects also being spec developers, specification developers, where they're, they have these great innovative ideas and they see these open mid-market or innovative open market opportunities and they're offering that to their OEMs. And with the OEMs, you know, commercialization engine, they can leverage that sales and marketing um, capability out in the field and be able to, you know, take, form that partnership. And then we're seeing some of our customers actually being, you know, legal manufacturers or, or device manufacturers themselves. Um, we got one 3D printer company that does nanotechnology 3D printer, and they just have so many great innovi innovative ideas. They're coming up with some of their own products. So I guess I kind of say that, and that's sort of uh, creating that energy and excitement in the CDMO industry. And we're seeing so many more the last year or two, you know, coming to us to look for systems to help them. Um, and then I think that's spawning, you know, as you mentioned, the PE investment, the OEM investment, or other CMs just looking to expand global footprint or their product lines. And Vincent, as a manufacturer company involved in the thick of this, what's your perspective? Yeah, so as the market evolves, I'm, we've also seen ISO evolve. We've also seen the expectations around the FDA regulations evolve. Um, in the last couple of years, they've actually started to converge on each other. So you see 9001 branch off, but in med device space, um, hate to put it in a different way, but it, they're tightening the noose on, on regulations and what it takes to ultimately launch product to the field. And when you look at that from a, a CDMO perspective, um, there, there is unfortunately cost associated with everything. So when you're looking at that, it's gone with the uh, build to print suppliers, the one stop shops that you can, you know, build this these partnerships with. It's now looking like Carlo was saying that vertical integration. You want to go to that one organization that you can partner with because switching between suppliers um, is is very costly, and the regulatory submission and the cost behind that uh, requires a, a, a vast amount of resources on the OEM side. So if you're looking at it from a CDMO perspective, you want to take your, your expertise, your, your existing portion of the supply chain, and vertically integrate in that perspective. Go backwards, go forwards, look at your engineering services that you're providing, look at your manufacturing capabilities that you're providing, and find something that complements it. So then you start looking at those acquisitions, because those experts are out there, that you can start appending those to your existing uh, manufacturing capabilities. And when you look at the value that can that you can drive from a, a supplier perspective, you then translate that into okay. So say in Tom's uh, perspective, we're we're primarily in spine, so we can expand on our existing portfolio because we've now brought in the additional capabilities that otherwise our, our OEMs are otherwise going elsewhere for. So driving that value back into the product, reducing cost and lead time for those customers, and then. All of these OEMs, as they continue to consolidate as well, have a number of different business units. I've been in surgical, I've been in diagnostic, I've been in uh, cardio uh, rhythm uh, management as well, and in neuromodulation. So with these OEMs, if you start integrating and creating that vertical integration, you start partnering with those existing customer, customers and expanding the portfolio that way. You actually are making yourself a better partner for those other business units. And you really start to turn the uh, contract manufacturing really into a manufacturing extension, an engineering extension of these OEMs. And that's where a lot of that evolution is occurring. So that's a great backdrop for what's going on in the industry from the perspective of deal makers, perspective of people who are servicing those deals and from people who are in the thick of the manufacturing um, arena every day. And now let's look at what happens, you know, how is this consolidation uh, ex impacting the operations of OEMs and other businesses in this industry? And why don't we start from the person who's in the middle of it? Vincent, why don't you start with that for us? 
All right, so we, we started to touch upon that with from the OEM perspective, um, with a number of manufacturers and they continue to grow and innovate and evolve capabilities that are out there now. Um, Again, with regulations changing, it's costly. So how do we, as an OEM, mitigate supply chain risk by consolidating our ASL, break, breaking it down so we have those key critical suppliers that we can partner with. For, you know, Five suppliers versus 100 can be very appealing. So you look at that and that's where that consolidation need, will start to occur or start to mirror with the strategy that the CDMOs are, are taking. Um, they, they start to look at how they take their existing processes and software and look at, at, at unifying and harmonizing across the organization what they're looking for. And that's, you look at that ASL consolidation, that one-stop shop, they're, they're looking at not just from the manufacturing capability standpoint, but DHF management as well. We, we kind of have an underlying theme of cost in there, and that's where engineering resources, the, the, the brains behind these activities can also be an impending cost to organizations as well. So taking that from the beginning, find a partner that not only can just manufacture, but bring it back to being a partner on the DHF side and pulling that through to manufacturing um, is where you're starting to see more than just consolidation of capabilities. It's consolidation of resources. It's consolidation of, of processes that make us efficient. And ultimately, that'll benefit the, uh, the customer as well as the patient themselves. And Carwell, what's your take on uh, how does it impact the OEMs? Yeah, well, Vincent talked about consolidation of uh, supply chain, so I don't really know what to say. No, I'm joking. I will, I will uh, bring it one uh, level further and say that um, these simplification of the supply chain um, involves not only the, the number of suppliers, um, but is introducing some um, types of, uh, of uh, risk-adjusted metrics to measure the sustainability of, of the supply chain itself. Um, not to, um, you know, uh, to measure, you know, COVID as a, uh, as a reason to, for this uh, trend or revolution, but there was certainly a, a time earlier in the pandemic where there was a fear that supply chains globally would uh, be affected by uh, the lack of um, uh, you know, flux of products from uh, offshore locations, for example. Let's not forget that, uh, especially for lower value components, um, uh, suppliers and CDMOs based in, in China and other Asia Pac countries are, are represent significant amount of volumes, and so um, that spurred um, a dialogue uh, strategically on how to uh, minimize risk of disruption in the supply chain, and uh, um, and we're seeing in the market some decision and some action towards uh, onshoring of select components of the supply chain uh, to diminish that risk and uh, measure uh, first and second suppliers uh, based on these risk-adjusted metrics. And um, at, at the end of the day, uh, this is uh, reflecting on uh, an evolution of the relationship between um, uh, OEMs and uh, outsourcing partners to create uh, incentives uh, related to quality and uh, sustainability of the uh, of the supplies uh, to to try to prevent and to set up processes that prevent uh, disruption and um, and eventually that w I believe is going to be one of the strategic factors that will continue to to drive uh, interest in outsourcing parts of. Uh, internal man, uh, operations that are, you know, still held close to the chest of uh, of OEMs, but they're, that little by little, with these um, uh, high-level partnership, are, are going to be farmed out more and more, and so I, you know, uh, ultimately prompting continuous growth in in the CDMO space. And Chuck, do you have any thought about the impact of OEMs? 
Uh, I could add another perspective. I didn't know exactly what you guys were going to say, but uh, maybe looking at it from, uh, since the abstract talks about pandemic recovery, I could take that stab. And, you know, we're seeing definitely a shortage in supply chain, shipping, storage, right? We're seeing automotive with the chips, medical device, PPE, oxygenation systems, you can go down the list. There's just been these shortages. And I think that the CDMOs have give this great perspective on how can we design for that availability? How can we adjust? How can we have, you know, not just single sources? I know in my past med dev companies is highly single source. And you always want to look at more alternate sources or dual sources so you can you know, reduce those high-risk components or subsystems um, that you're looking at. So I think that's one perspective. Um, another perspective would be that move of what's been globalization for so many years, decades, right, is moving a little bit more towards a nationalism where you want to have your trade sources more close and local to you. Um, I think that that is, spawns upon the advent of, you know, nearshoring versus offshoring, you know, the same language or the same time zones, maybe the same languages, maybe a little more proximity. So I think that's another uh, part of that, that element. And then I guess um, one other thought I had, um, languages, and I guess maybe just foreign, foreign companies, like foreign OEMs that want to have a more local presence, might be looking to make acquisitions, to bring it back to the M&A tie, but maybe looking for acquisitions you know, in the US and in that space as well. And with all these acquisitions going on, there's a dramatic impact inside the company of both the target and the acquirer, and there's a particular impact on IP and technology. So let's turn to our technologist, Chuck from Propel. Tell us what we're seeing for the impact of IP and technology based on the consolidation boom. Okay, yeah, intellectual property and technology. So I'll probably take it more from the software angle here, but you know, you obviously got to make sure that your your data, so there's all different types of IP, but you want to make sure that it's very secure, that you're able to collaborate with your partners, and that, um, you know, you're positioned well for any instances like, you know, we continue to go back to M&A or divestitures or joint ventures or whatever might happen. So I guess if you think about the different types of IP, you know, at the early stages, you're gathering your, you know, customer marketing requirements, your customer needs. Um, you know, developing the specs and processes and drawings, this is all part of your IP. Um, even to the point of software, where you want to get those agreements in place very early um, so that you know who's developing it, who owns that data. I think these are really important elements that lend even into like your patent strategies so that you work on your patent portfolios early on and, you know, before you make it available publicly, that you have these agreements and these, these conditions in place. Um, those are I IP elements that, that we talk about a lot with our customers, um, even to the point of trade secrets, um, building up your DHF, your DMR for design transfer, and, and having a, a very good mechanism to, to transfer that information securely. So I think that leads to a secure platform, something like, as mentioned, the Salesforce platform, you know, most secure in the world, um, where you can build your, the apps you're on that are built natively for the cloud. They're built... Um, on one platform, ideally. Um, and then having the right document management system, quality management system, QMS, PLM for your product structure and your bomb, so that you can have that information um, very easy to share, as we talked about, like from a partner portal standpoint. Or part 11 compliance for electronic signature and records. Having that all built into the system is very important. Um, even your PHI, like your personal health information, so you can manage it from uh, data in transit or data at rest or de-identify the data and, and be able to configure it properly so that only the right people can see that data. Those are the things that, that come to mind. And then I think the level of partnership that you have, you know, OEM to CDMO is important too as to which systems or subsystems that you want to, you know, have them build or even to the OEM managing down the supplier level, down to the component level, as you mentioned, ASL, those are all really important elements that you, you, know, you need to be able to control. Um, you know, we see a lot of OEMs that then want to share that data out. If you have those structures in place, it's very easy to share that data if you have the right tool that has share permissions and built in the cloud and all that. And then we're also seeing the CDMOs coming to us saying, okay, well, we want our own QMS system, our PLM system for, for product structure, and we want to share that data with our OEMs. I think that's kind of looking at it the other direction, and that's something where I talked about we're seeing a lot of increase in that, where they're putting in these more formal systems. They're recognizing the regulations and standards. And I guess lastly is the collaboration element. You want to be able to collaborate with your CDMOs 
in OEM so you can collaborate on your workflows, like your first article inspections, your you know, production part approval process, um, NCMRs. Even to the point of like what you're getting from you know the patients and, and customers as far as like complaints or incidences that you want to feed through the system and and do a very quick resolution, uh, incident to resolution time to to close that so you can do those cycles with the CDMO to to do those fixes, um, and I think data is gold. Um, you know you've got patient data. You got to make sure you have the right terms of use. But now that if you can start collecting that that patient data, then you can start reporting on it, making decisions. Um, I think that's another important element. And then lastly, I think that having these tools in place, having these systems in place and these, these technologies makes, again, these CMOs and that much more desirable and acquirable um, you know, um, in, in the market. So I, I think that's my perspective. And Carlo or Vincent, do you have any thoughts on the impact of an IP and technology of an acquisition? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, Chuck brought up some really great points, and I can certainly speak from experience, and I'm going to make a, a bold statement, but uh, a lot of medical device manufacturing is, is very antiquated. So paper-based, manual, whether it's quality system processes or manufacturing through uh, DHR uh, retention and management, very paper-based. So if you go to a lot of organizations, it's uh, those ha manual handoffs. It's when you're looking at... Um, looking at the effectiveness and the performance of your manufacturing processes or the effectiveness of your QMS, um, you, you're actually requiring individuals or staffing individuals to, to mine that data uh, to even get some lagging indicator of how you're performing. So back to Chuck's point about using technology, using the current technology to streamline those types of operations that really run your business, um, incredibly important when not only for organizations or CDMOs to flip from manual to these systems, but then also on the consolidation piece once the acquisitions occur. It's, uh, it's one thing to be automated, to have that, that data at your fingertips. It's another if you have an organization with five different systems that don't talk to each other. So really using a platform you know, like Salesforce, like, like Propel and, and, and other uh, PLM systems that allow you to intertwine quality pro processes with dot control management, with manufacturing uh, effectiveness, um, and, and having that information at your fingertips is incredibly powerful because a lot of med device organizations are still, you know, they got the back room where they have individuals actually, you know, pulling that data out from, from their charts and monitoring logs. So very important in, in, in finding that organization that's starting to invest and innovate in that space um, is probably going to be a strong partner for you. I agree, and uh, I think that this aspect of integration uh, um, between OEM and, uh, and CDMO on the IP generation uh, is, uh, is a necessity, uh, as uh, delivering innovation to the market is becoming more and more difficult and more competitive. And uh, OEMs, whether they are large multinational companies or funded startups, they don't own all the capabilities, all the competencies to, to develop all aspects of, of their products. Um, and, uh, and they have to rely on, on experts that can do that efficiently at, at, a, at a lower cost uh, to accelerate time to market. Um, going back to my earlier comment regarding the importance of, uh, for CDMOs to own um, design, product design and engineering capabilities, that, that's really the key. Uh, I think the model uh, that, uh, based on which OEMs develop the entire technology in-house is over. And uh, the, the importance of um, uh, having some trusted suppliers uh, that can uh, innovate and, and deliver form, human form factor analysis, user interface, um, you know, uh, data connectivity, areas that are not really part of the, of the common competencies of, of, of traditional medtech players is going, to, is, going, is going to deliver a lot of value to the industry. Now, who owns the innovation is a different aspect, whether that is uh, owned by the customer uh, based on, on contract or generated by 
the the outsourcing partner and then license back to the customer um, is also something that is trending and uh, that we see more often this definitely more often than a decade ago where there was a clear separation of who on the right to the to the technology to pieces of the innovation whether it's in the design for manufacturability or in the in the in the concept of the device itself you dave are definitely more competent than me on on this subject and uh yeah, it, this is a, this is a, um, a transition towards new models that I think is going to be very exciting to to look at in the next uh, few years. And I think the panelists did a great job of hitting on the key points. But as an IP lawyer who's done a lot of due diligence on these type of acquisitions for the acquirer, oftentimes a private equity shop, we can tell you the key is in the agreements and what are the key clauses in those agreements and making sure if you have software that you have the ownership of that software locked up and it wasn't developed by some third party who is lost in the wind five, six years later, or more and more developed in Eastern Europe where it's difficult to track down the coders. So the key to is these acquisitions take time. You see the headlines, little do you know that the first contact was probably 12 months or more before the headline happened. And at that time, the diligence, getting all these I's dotted and T's crossed and getting your agreements in place and making sure you own the innovations, don't license them back or worse, are silent and it's not clear who owns them. Because if you have to get the document signed at the 11th hour, the other party knows that they have leverage and oftentimes they try to extract a premium. If uh, you developed the code for a few thousand dollars 10 years ago and now all of a sudden you see the company's worth a lot of money, you know they're coming to you because they really need that document. And you can say, sure, I'm willing to sign that, but now I want a payment just to sign it. And oftentimes companies are left with nothing to do but to pay that payment because otherwise a deal's not gonna happen or it's gonna happen for a lower valuation. So I think that's it, but let's look in, you know, let's talk about the acquisitions. What do you wish an OEM would know now and what could they do now to help them be acquired for a premium down the road? Carlo, you want to start with that one? What's the second part of your question again? What could an OEM customer, what do you wish they knew now as they're looking forward to the future? Well, uh, in the past year and a half, or a good part of it, uh, OEMs wanted to know when are procedures, uh, non, non elective procedure going back to the clinic. Um, there has been a, a dramatic cliff in, the, in, in many uh, types of procedures, uh, surgical procedures particularly, that have uh, had um, important economic, negative economic impact on, um, on many of these uh, categories of, uh, of products. So, uh, you know, improving your ability to predict uh, performance, I think that's, that's key. And uh, the, um, uh, the, the trickle-down effect on the supply chain is uh, being able to plan uh, your, uh, your supply chain better and, uh, and, and reduce your cost and, uh, and prevent, uh, prevent uh, mitigate risks. So um, uh, obviously, you know, that has been put to test during the pandemic. And uh, I believe as uh, the consolidation and um, the migration towards an outsourcing model continues, uh, there will also benefit uh, for this continuum and uh, uh, so that our industry can become more, more efficient and uh, more integrated and, and more safe. And Vincent, as a manufacturing company, what do you wish some of the OEMs would know now? Sure. So we talked about uh, quite a bit of evolution that's occurred in the market, in innovation and technology, as well as the regulations. And right now, from a CDMO perspective, it's it, it's an aggressive market out there. It's 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 selling yourselves as the right partner for the OEM. And I think what would be really critical for OEMs to know is is that that partnership is not transactional like it used to be. It's not just place an order, make a part. It truly is, and we've said it, I think, all a couple times now, that, that partnership. So 
the approach and the evaluation of, of choosing that partner or that extension, uh, it, it needs to evolve and be more complex. So it's not just about manufacturing capability and piece part price. It's, it's their leadership. Do they have the right leadership in place to ensure they're going to innovate, they're going to invest in their staff, they're going to have longevity uh, you know, in that partnership, but then also breaking it down to, back to the trend I was saying, it's not just about the acquisition, it's also the execution. So looking at how they've executed their, their internal acquisitions, have they harmonized software? Have they harmonized processes? Because the last thing you want to do as an OEM is go in and say, um, I've, I'm working with this organization, but I go through the five sites and they all look different. They all operate differently. And that ends up still being just as the same amount of work as uh, you know working with five independent suppliers on your ASL. So that, that complexity of evaluation need, is important. And that really brings us back to uh, a lot of the other themes we've said. It's, it's QMS processes, it's the software systems, Use, using that, taking advantage of that so that all those day-to-day -day operational um, activities that a CDMO has to go through is passed on, and, and you'll realize it in cost. You'll realize it in time to market because we've taken these processes and, and streamlined supply chain even between sister sites. I'm not placing a PO to Chuck because he's at the next location. We've used the system to drive internal demand so that we've actually cut down the lead time on how we move material through. So. What really got to look at all all the many different layers of the evaluation when you're when you're selecting that supplier. Someone that knows the market, someone that knows how to navigate the evolving ISO and FDA requirements, and knows how to facilitate that with with the right processes and the right software. So, so we have just a couple minutes left, but we did want to make sure we had time for any audience questions. Does anyone have a question for the panel? So I had a question for everybody, but based on something Carlos said, in, in terms of the the frothiness of the PE mark, you're kind of scaring me a little bit here in terms of if the CDMOs are doing roll-ups and are going to end up being financially unstable because they're having to pay down their debt, you know, is it actually going to be smart for OEMs to to go to those types of companies? I, I, again, I, I worry a little bit when you, you kind of said it's so, you know, so much interest in PE money coming in. Again, in terms of a partnership, where you talk about a partnership, the notion of a, a PE firm who, by definition, is going to be out within 10 years, how do you feel like they're going to be a good partner if it's PE owned and they're going to flip it you know, in, in that time frame? So I'm just trying to I understand why PE money's in, interested in being in the space, but how do you think we should think about managing those risks? My perspective is that, uh, first of all, before any transaction can be completed on a on a CDMO uh, the sign-off of the key customers is required because that's a big part of the value of the asset you're buying and uh, of the target and uh, and so customers have to buy in into the into the project knowing well that in a few years the the platform the, the asset will be flipped over again to another buyer before finding a permanent home, maybe, maybe never, right? Uh, there are many secondary buyouts that happen all the time. So it hasn't really been a limiting factor of m and activity. And um, I'm sure it's a, it's a subject of uh, the evaluation by the OEMs. Uh, and um, in the process of consolidating the supply chain and uh, and trusting a fewer number of supplier, like Vincent said, it's important to to trust the people and trust the leadership of these um, of these outsourcing partners uh, to continue to do their job. And um, uh, I think you know, it, ultimately, it's about building long term relationships, whether that's um, executed contractually, uh, and you know, in. in including long-term incentive to reducing cost and increasing quality. Uh, OEMs don't really care who is the owner. Obviously, this, the financial stability of, of the supplier is important, and I think that's that's part of the vetting process. Uh, and uh, but I would, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem like a huge risk factor in the in the big scheme of things. 
I started okay. to touch on it just high level. If I can add a few points, um, it, it is that deeper, the second, third layer of the evaluation. It's not just what are they capable of and will they deliver? It's what I've actually done at Tom's and in prior organizations as well. As a part of these initial scoping activities, these business reviews, you're actually looking at and it's okay from an OEM perspective to say, what have you done to invest in your organization in the last five to 10 years? How have you continuously improved your technology, your systems? What is your, your turnover rate? You start to get a better sense of how they operate because I, I think your, your fear is because it's, 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 it would seem transactional. It's let's put in the three to seven years, flip it and move on to the next. And then from an OEM perspective, there's a lot of stop and start. So what I would encourage is, is looking in deeper dive into the history of how those CDMOs have been operating, how long have their leadership been in tail and in, in how do they drive their organization. I think that'll give you a better sense of, of whether or not they, again, will be a partner going forward versus, you know, just, just, the, just the next customer on the list. Probably have time for one more question. Anyone? Comments? Thoughts? Hope he answered your question. Well, I've got a question for the panel to wrap it up. Um, so we've learned about what's happened, you know, in 2020 and 2021, how COVID really the CM, CMDO acquisition has been thriving. What do you see in your crystal ball? What do you see over the next six months and into 2022? Is the boom going to continue or is there going to be something else going on? And why don't we start at the far end with Chuck? His company's in the middle of the boom, closed a $20 million uh, Series C venture capital round this morning. I bet you're hoping for boom times, Chuck. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm looking forward to the opportunities that I had from that and the way, what it creates. Um, I'm going to keep it simple, just a uh, crystal ball trend. Probably just that, you know, data is the high value currency, you know, going forward. And, you know, when we talk about patient data, we talk about um, customer data. You know, how, how do we pull that data out, slice it, dice it, use it? Um, how do we, uh, I guess, how do we, you know, how do we leverage that data? I know there's tools that, you know, are on the dawning front here of AI and ML and all those, right? Um, pulling the information out of um, these registries or these, these places that have data so that we can work on creating better outcomes. And, and how do we pull this together to do that? That's just one thought I've been looking to, to into 2022 for. And Vincent, what's your crystal ball? What do you see? I think we're gonna continue to see acquisitions. I think at a point it may even plateau. Um, we, you're gonna see suppliers that have comparable manufacturing capabilities, comparable services. Um, this is where the, the X factor is going to start to come in of, okay, how between all of these that have very similar capabilities, what are those behavioral, what are those um, X factor capabilities and services that they bring from their uh, leadership, their project team that will add the most value to what they're, what they're providing to you. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see uh, the softer side of how these suppliers compare each other. And Carlo? As far as uh, M&E activity to reach a plateau, I, th I agree. Uh, there will be many secondary buyouts of uh, mid to large size uh, CDMO platforms owned by PEs that will transact, either bought out by corporate acquirers or uh, um, merging or you know finding new financial sponsor, with the consequence that there will be a more consolidated Top of the market with uh, multiple players, uh, you know, of mid to large size, and then a plethora of uh, of smaller uh, local manufacturers. So there, it will be. I, I think the the pro the trend is of going towards a two speed industry, uh, one of high quality, large, diversified, and international manufacturers, and then uh, uh, smaller specialized players who will, uh, to some extent. Um, you know, I have to fight for for survival in this uh, context, and uh, it will be exciting to see what happens. Yeah. And I think, from my perspective, I think we're going to see the consolidation continue, but eventually, once the companies have the same capabilities, it's going to be about the innovation and technology, which companies can really innovate and deliver the better product at the better price, and that's always what the big manufacturers are going to be looking for. 
So with that, please give a round of applause to the panelists today for sharing their knowledge. And thank you to Lori for organizing this.